Hey everybody, I'm Matt Eastland and welcome to the Food Fight podcast from EIT Food, exploring the greatest challenges facing the food system and the innovations and entrepreneurs looking to solve them. In today's episode, we're doing something different. As regular listeners will know, we host a wide variety of different guests here on the podcast, from food innovators and influencers to regenerative farmers and researchers, and we pride ourselves on speaking to everyone interested in accelerating food system transformation. And these conversations are super exciting, they spark curiosity, and they call us all to action. At the same time, we also shine a light on the amazing work that the EIT food community is driving forward, from our own initiatives and programme portfolios to our ever-growing network and investments, there's always a lot to talk about at EIT Food and the impact that our community is having. So today I wanted to bring someone special on the show who's going to help me unlock the full picture of what's happening here and now at EIT Food and maybe share us a bit of the blueprint for our future and how this is going to improve our food system. It brings me great pleasure to introduce EIT Foods' new CEO, Richard Zaltzman. Richard was appointed as CEO in January this year, so that's 2024, having joined back in 2021 and previously serving as our Chief Impact Officer. Richard has held various uh, senior executive roles at EIT Climate Kick, Microsoft, and a range of organizations across the innovation and sustainability sectors. Richard's dedicated to tackling some of the biggest environmental and societal challenges we face within the food system. Richard, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you for having me. Um, okay, Richard, first of all, just want to say massive congratulations on uh, on the CEO role. You must be delighted. Absolutely. I mean, it... it, it... It really is an incredible place to be here at EIT Food and within the community that we're privileged to be a part of. So, yeah, taking the role in, in January, only three weeks ago. This is week four. Amazing. It still feels very fresh, but absolutely delighted, humbled. Um, and it's an immense privilege to take this organisation into the next few years of food systems transformation. Well, that's great. And it's really great to have you to have you on the show and also to have you leading us uh, into the next stage of our evolution. Um, so, Richard, just sort of starting with... Let's start from the past then. So maybe you could outline for our listeners a bit about your backstory, your kind yeah. of career to date. Yeah, sure. I started back in the 90s as a geologist, actually, oh, with, really? which created a kind of a deep interest in sustainability. In, there was a lot of climate change in the course that we did. So I thought, oh, I'm going to do my degree, maybe do a master's in environmental science. I'll land in the sustainability field, bearing in mind this was the mid 90s. Mm. And life took one of those sliding doors moments. And instead of, of actually doing that, I thought, I'll get some tech experience, got myself into the consulting sector and then technology. And so I found myself at Microsoft having an amazing career in one of the world's most innovative in companies, you know, love them or hate them. Microsoft are brilliant innovators and they really know how to affect change in the world. Yep. Um, and yeah, it, it was one of those moments, again, having got into that track in tech and learned just so much about innovation, about change, about pace and drive. Then I had an opportunity to to reset and come back to that that sustainability field that I'd, you know, I'd had the spark lit early days when mm. I was doing my first degree. And I got that opportunity in 2017. So enjoyed a year out doing a master's at UCL in environmental economics Oh, wow. um, which really gave me a great grounding in the in the fundamentals of what it takes to change systems when you're trying to achieve sustainability as an outcome. Um, and then from there, joined joined Climate Kick and then on to EIT Food. So it's been one of these, it was, a, it was something that just kind of bubbles in your soul, really. Mm. Um, and it, the tech sector gave me an awful lot of inspiration that I'm, that, uh, things can change. Enormous things can change. If you look at the the impact that technology has had in the world in the last 30, 40 years and continues to do so at an accelerating pace, it proves without doubt you can change things when you get the right organisations and the right people and the right momentum and, and frankly the right mindset behind those challenges. Mm. And that's what I really want to bring here to EIT Food now is that sense of, yes, we absolutely can do this. There are no challenges that are insurmountable given the people we've got and the organisations we've got and the you know just the drive and the passion for this subject. 
I love it. It's sort of like technology and innovation with purpose, sort of really changing the world. And that's what I love about the podcast is we have so many people who, are, you know, they, they all say it in a different way, but they all kind of completely aligned. It's it's about being able to drive that impact with purpose, with tech, with innovation. And yeah, I'm very similar to you in that. A techno optimist, I yeah. think, uh, is the phrase that we're I like in. that. That's yeah. a keeper. <laughs> well, we we had uh, Tony the Futurist on uh, the previous show, and he was very much talking about techno optimism. So um, that's great. And um, so let's talk about the passion for food. Yeah. And so, or maybe specifically food systems transformation. Yeah. Where, where did that come from? Okay. So the when you look at the sustainability challenge overall, humanity is facing multiple challenges on multiple fronts. The climate challenge is an interesting one, and I know I'm going to frustrate some of the listeners here. I'm going to grossly oversimplify the climate (laughs) challenge and say, from a carbon emissions perspective, in in some arenas, let's take urban or transport, it's effectively an electrification issue. Just keep banging out the renewable energy, electrify everything, job, in quotes, done. Okay. But it's not that the technology is lacking there or the societal change elements are lacking there. It's fundamentally deploy capital, get it done, political will. And we can see that happening in certain areas. You can see it happening in the North Sea. You know, our, our electricity supply for the UK has fundamentally transformed over the last 10 or 15 years. A yep. couple of smart interventions um, around the auctions and the CFDs, etc., makes that market move. So when it... Again, I will repeat, I'm grossly simplifying, but some elements of the climate challenge come back to massive amounts of renewable energy, just keep it coming, electrify everything, and then clean up some clean up the outliers. Now, food systems are very, very different. It's mm. not just a carbon problem. It's multiple types of emissions that are creating uh, global warming from farming. And it's not just a global warming issue. The, the, the landscapes that we source our food from are critical sources for biodiversity, for nature-based services, including um, flood risk prevention, including air air quality management, etc. And when you look at the food system, if we get this right, we've got so many benefits beyond just reducing emissions that we can return to our environment, to the globe as a whole. Mm. And at the same time, the challenge is not unidirectional. It's not just an energy challenge. Yes, there's an energy component to it, but there are many, many more components. And when I, when I started to understand that, partly through the, the the degree, partly through time to think about it, partly just by getting stuck in at EIT food, you realize this, if you want to work in possibly the hardest corner of the global challenge space, I think the food sector is it. And mm-hmm. so bang on, let's go for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we've had, um, we've had people on the show, and we've interviewed people before, and it's what comes through a lot is... If you you can't fix the climate unless you fix food. No, that, that's and, the yeah. one thing. You know, food has to be at the centre of this. And I think we're again when we we talk about food, we often think about the plate, um, and we very much need to think about the food system as a whole, starting in the in the fields, in the farm, and then flowing all the way through to you and me and everybody else who every single day we have a universal need for food and nutrition in mm-hmm. our diets, and it's that. That whole system, I you know, certainly one of our focuses is going to be to try and pull back the focus from the plate closer and closer to the source because that's where the system starts to transform at the at the source rather than at the at the end of the process. So, yeah, for me it, it's a it's an amazing place to be right now. The agenda's gone m- mad in the last mm. two years since COP in Egypt, where food systems was a, a kind of a a quiet but increasing drum in the background to Dubai this year where it was a food systems summit to all intents and purposes, arguably because that was to disguise the fact that it was not a constructive oil system summit, but that's fine from somebody in the food system Hmm. really pleased to have that opportunity to to explode the understanding of the challenge facing us globally and the opportunity that the food system provides for really addressing many of the acute sustainability challenges. And it was absolutely something which was being driven by E80 Food as well in terms of, you know, we were the secretary of the Food Systems Partnership. Yep. So it's great that we're that we're really kind of behind this. So let's let's talk a little bit about, um, about E80 Food then. So can I ask... EIT food, the EIT food community. Mm-hmm. What, what does it what does it mean to you? Yeah, well, 
I think it's rare that you get the opportunity to be a community that are focused on on such an important critical transformation. If you're in a company and I've worked in in big companies, yeah. you've got a set of commercial goals and then many companies are truly committed to their sustainability journey, but they still have to achieve those commercial goals. For us at EIT Food and similar organizations in our space, the other kicks, some NGOs, etc., we are really, really lucky to be able to focus on our missions, mm. net zero food systems, healthy lives through food and reducing risk for a fair and resilient food system. So we are truly a mission oriented organization and our mission is really about food systems transformation with the outcomes being a sustainable future fit food system for all. And that I think is, it's not unique per se, but to be doing that in the food sector is very, very special. Mm -hmm. And I think EIT Food and our legacy over the past six years, we've created a community of of people, of students who've been trained, of entrepreneurs who've been with us on a journey of growing their companies, of, of organizations large and small, who've all committed their passion and energy and time to the same vision of what we want to achieve. And that again, so you've got two things. One, being able to focus on missions, that's quite unique. And to be able to do that with a community, I don't know how many other organizations there are, but there's probably only a handful of organizations that are a community organization drawing on all of that potential, all of that human capital, combined with a deep and exclusive mission focus that mm. puts us in a very, very unique space. Yeah, it does. Yeah, and I, I'm, you know, I personally love being in this space. It's it's unique, I think. Um, and tell us about a little bit about your tenure at EIT Food. Then, so obviously, new role. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be interested to understand, you know, how is this building on what you've done previously and how is the CEO position, do you think, going to be different from what's come before? Yeah. Um, well, my last role at EIT Food before this uh, this one was Chief Impact Officer. One of those titles doesn't really say a great deal. <laughs> um, and it can be interpreted in many ways. Fundamentally, as an organisation that is seeking to affect change in the world, everything we do has to have a clear impact. And that might be the impact you intended at the start, or it might not, mm. and you work out where did we go that we didn't anticipate. If I look back at us, and I'm really honest, in the past, our our portfolio of work was probably somewhat low-balled in places. Okay. So some of the projects we've done, they might have been interesting scientifically, but they were not really connected with impact that could affect part of a food systems transformation. Um, and I think that's down to many, many factors. Having now worked in the kick environment for over five years, the the chasing of KPIs and metrics, et cetera, that come with funding can cloud your view. And it's very, it, it's a natural kind of slip back to running projects which just produce those outcomes. Yep. That said, we have to look back and say, we could have done better. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really keen that we look that right in the eye and say, actually, we've really got to focus on the impact we want to have, not on just churning the projects through the system. And that's a fundamental mind shift change. And we're starting to see that now come through in the way we're going to our community and saying, bring us bigger, better, bolder ideas. Because if, if we can't get those ideas off the ground, we're not going to affect food systems transformation. And if we're going with the small stuff, we're not going to affect food systems transformation. Mm -hmm. So let's collectively really commit to the end goal, which is a different food system, we can see that we collectively have stepped into a space that has built the foundations for Europe's food system to get closer towards a net zero food system. We've built the foundation so that people's diets can lead to better health outcomes, etc. And that that's a difficult journey for many people to go through because it requires that bravery to step away from what you've been comfortable doing in the past, commit to bigger stuff that can succeed remarkably. Um, and if it doesn't succeed, you've also got to have the confidence that whatever you achieve, you can then recycle that and, and redirect it. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm coming from. I, I, you know, I had two years before this role to really understand the organization, understand where we've come from and the enormous potential of what we've done of the organizations who are in our community. And now really our focus is on making sure that everything we do going forward is truly focused on having an impact at the food system level. Yeah. 
Okay, so and, and, uh, interesting, you, you just said the same word a, a few times there, so focus. So do you see that as CEO, your role is shifting towards focusing the, org- the community and the organisation towards greater impact? Completely, and focusing through tighter lenses as well, to be honest, right. Matt, because look, the food system is very, very broad. It is. Very broad. And we get... If you, when I speak to our startups, when I speak to our partners, when you speak to the the team at EIT Food, we're not short of ideas of stuff to do, mm-hmm. um, and you, we can run the risk of being drowned in great ideas at the expense of committing to focused intervention so that we have impact in the food system that we we are confident is going to take us in the right direction. So that focus is both on making sure that what we are doing is designed to have impact. And also that we are focused on the areas where we want to affect impact. Mm-hmm. And we've got a great framework now to support us to do that. We need to test it. You know, we've developed it. We now need to test it and really bring our concentration and our focus in to say these are the areas that we are going to commit to. And, yeah, we we are still a small organization. We can't do the whole thing on our own. And I think it, it's also down to us to be confident that if we choose not to work in a certain space, that others will. And, and it's our role to partner with those and connect the system overall. But we want to deploy our community, our resources, our funding and our focus in certain areas within that. Okay. That's that's great. And it, you've almost kind of moved me on to the next part of this, which is we're sort of starting to think about where EIT Food and our community is going in the future. So previously, Richard, you and I have spoken about a concept called what I think you've called it regenerative leadership. Mm-hmm. And I know that's something you're really passionate about. Maybe you could explain for our listeners what what is regenerative leadership and, you know, why why is this so important to you? Yes, <sighs> These challenges are are very very long term. Again, when when I speak to people and I've spoken to people over the last few weeks in the new role, this isn't something we're going to fix because corporate targets require something done by twenty thirty or twenty forty, yeah. etc. It's this is a very very long term journey and probably never ends when you think about the food system and its and its utterly critical existential role when embedded in society and humanity. So when you're facing something which is effectively a perpetually evolving challenge, we've got to have a, a mindset of, of engagement and leadership that allows people to work in that space without getting burnt out, without thinking, where's the end? Where's the end of the road? And mm. for me, regenerative leadership is a bit like the work some of the amazing pioneer farmers are doing on regenerative landscapes. You, you work on the soil that's the bedrock of what you of what we do so you work on the soil and you work on your culture as an organization and you work on the community and then from that soil you can grow regenerative crops year after year if you look after the soil and you keep those processes growing and for us we can we can create the capability for leadership we create the ideas and the creativity we need continually um, and it just requires a mindset set shift that allows us to focus on multiple horizons at one time. We have mm-hmm. to have that long-term, almost perpetual understanding in mind and at the same time be able to go after the tangible impact year after year, month after month, etc. But effectively the equivalent being you, you grow crops off the landscape and you harvest those crops, absolutely. But you also have to nurture the landscape in perpetuity. Mm-hmm. And it's that mindset for leadership. When I, again, look at some companies, they're brilliant at it. You've got some organizations who create that perpetual flywheel of of s- super strong performance year after year after year and others who peak and drop and peak and drop and so for me regenerative leadership in an area like food systems transformation means you're not doing the peak and drop peak and drop mm-hmm. but you're creating a culture and a core of people all the way through any organization this is not a top down leadership mindset it's an it's an absolutely embedded leadership concept that everybody can embrace around taking taking ownership is probably the wrong word embracing this challenge being able to recognize that they whatever you do you will have a part to play in affecting a really important positive outcome in the world mm. and and throwing yourself into it in such a way that every day when you put your mind 
and your effort and your time and your conversations into that process, you're taking yourself, your organization and the food system a little step forward. Okay, love that. And you spoke about sort of like peaks and troughs. Any any thoughts on how you keep people at the peaks and you avoid the troughs? <laughs> yeah, I think one, one thing is probably, again, we... We humans love a sprint and a short-term goal. You know, when you hit the panic button, stuff happens. It feels good. You get the dopamine hit. Um, and that that works in certain circumstances. And again, we've all been there. We've all been there where you've just got, the, got to get something done and push, whether that's on a personal basis or whether the whole organization has, right, we've got to turn this organization and we've got to focus on X, Y, and Z for a period of time. The... Uh, you will have to recognize those peaks and troughs. Um, they average out. And it's really important, I think, that we collectively recognize you've got to keep some reserves in the tank. Mm-hmm. Um, I I had a absolutely remarkable leader at Microsoft um, who he was CEO of Microsoft UK, Michelle van der Bell, And he was a he was a passionate advocate for personal resilience and right. kind of keeping your own energy up, especially as a leader, because without it, you can't you can't do your job. You can't lead others. You can't be the person you want to be when you turn up to work. So I think part of the, for me, part of the the constant challenge of the peaks and troughs is just is at a very personal level, not getting into a peak and trough cycle, not going mm-hmm. for the sugar rush and the caffeine hit and then crashing at the weekend. You know, yeah. It's really simple things. It starts with, with me um, and it starts with you just really thinking, how do I keep myself at a level which nourishes me mm. gives me the rest and the and the nourishment and the exercise and the family time etc that i need so that then i can do the same when i'm out with partners or out with startups etc trying to engage on the food systems transformation piece so a long answer it, it starts with a personal journey of recognizing that every now and then you've got to red line and you've got to push really hard there's all there's going to be something that requires that extra little push but culturally that should very much be an exception and if we want truly regenerative leadership and regenerative capability in people we have to ex- really build that understanding that we have to nourish ourselves like you nourish the land mm. in order to produce the outcomes that we want um, from our organization and our community it sounds like there's another another whole episode in here <laughs> richard about regenerative i mean i have to admit it's something i still have not cracked but i think this is for another time but i love i love that idea and and within regenerative leadership i'm assuming that you must have some yes it's like a it's a big long term goal all of this but you must have some kind of objectives in mind about what what you want to achieve coming next yes um i mean i'd like to i'd like to inspire our community, including the EIT food folk and our partners and the broader community to just start to be inspired that we can achieve a much, much more significant change in the world if we work together and collectively to do that. Mm. And again, working together, you share that load, you share the peaks and the troughs and they do smooth out to a certain extent. And this isn't something I can slap a concrete example on because in a way that that just kind of brings it back down to a level of tactics. For me, this is a mindset and an ethos that we as a community are way more powerful than any one organization is on its own to affect food systems transformation. Even if I took something simple like our voice in the political arena, if we are, as EIT Food, are trying to bang on the door about a topical issue in Brussels, let's Let's take um, novel food stuffs, right? Mm-hmm. Part of what we're trying to do within our missions is open the door so that we can see novel technologies providing solutions to challenges like diet or novel technologies being able to be deployed by farmers to reduce emissions on farm biologicals and new fertilizers. And we know there's a policy landscape there which is not necessarily supporting those those outcomes as effectively as it might, let's say. Um, there's room for policy to open up and allow those solutions to come through more quickly or create an environment where they can test and fail more quickly. Now, we can we can go and knock on that door, um, but as a community together, if we start to raise our voice on the two or three things that really will make a difference to food systems transformation collectively and coherently, then I think we'll have a... We'll, we'll, have a much much greater chance of having impact in that space exactly Mm. exactly 
Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, and just, I mean, we touched on this a little bit at the start of the show, but just reflecting on the food system in general, biggest issues facing the food system from your perspective at the moment? Wow, okay. Um, so there's a couple that I'd like to highlight. One, I think, is obviously it's a it's a really, really difficult job being a farmer mm-hmm. in every country. And we're seeing this um, in in very, very present terms right now. Farmers are taking to the roads in their tractors and they are protesting um, and trying to make their voice heard to say, what you're asking us to do is something that we're not equipped to do. We, You're asking us to take a burden for society that we're not equipped to take. Mm. And that, I think, is a really important voice to listen to because we will not get food systems transformation that doesn't start in the field. Yeah. So I think number one is really understanding how do you take a community of people who often are multi-generational on that land. It's a it's an intensely personal um, feeling of, of ownership of that land, of stewardship of that land, but also risk and in many cases, farming is not a high reward. It is not something you go into for the money as, mm-hmm. an, as a farmer. You know, my my grandfather was a farmer in South Africa. Is that it, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a scratching a living mm. um, environment. So I think number one is just pausing for thought. And when you look at the macroeconomic systems, if I can be a little bit provocative, we're spending hundreds of billions globally still subsidizing the fossil fuel sector mm-hmm. whether that's r&d tax subsidies in the uk for oil drilling all the way through to much more overt subsidies on petrol etc um farming diesel is yeah and which is almost a conundrum in itself yeah we are still subsidizing materially enormously damaging activity to the tune of trillions of dollars globally and at the same time we're saying we can't invest much, much smaller sums in the farming system to enable farmers to de-risk any commitment we're asking them to make to start the process of moving towards a sustainable food system. Mm -hmm. So I think that for me is something I would love us to address. I'd love us to have a much, much firmer voice on that collectively as a community to say, look, if you can't just ask a farmer to do this. You can't legislate for a farmer to do this and then at the same time leave the leave the oil companies with their trillion dollar balance sheets to carry on getting enormous amounts of subsidies. I, th- I think we're going to have to pick a battle mm-hmm. and really, really go in and go in quite hard as a community invested in the food system. Mm-hmm. That for me is probably challenge number one. Challenge number two, a lot of companies have are now realizing they've got to, to do this. They need to commit to net zero targets, they need to commit to science-based targets, they need to be seen to be doing something. And many companies truly want to change their their relationship with the food uh, producers and suppliers. So you've got corporates who are making big commitments on regenerative sourcing, on net zero, either at the company level or at a product level or even at an ingredient level. And when you trace that back downstream to the farmer, what you're seeing is real pressure coming into a farmer from multiple directions. Let's just take regenerative. Mm -hmm. If you're a farmer and you've got um, an agreement with company A and they buy your first crop from you and they say, "We we want that crop to be regenerative and here are our standards for that crop. And then company B comes along and they, they have a different crop. They've got crop two. And they say, well, here are our standards for crop two and we want you to measure these things too. Mm -hmm. If you're a farmer, you can be doing over five years, for four crops maybe over seven years maybe five crops um and that set of standards is can be crippling right you're in this mess you're just measuring stuff the whole time you're not farming you're just measuring stuff you're Mm -hmm. a data analyst i think that's something as well which will make a huge difference is if we can engage better with companies collectively really bring them into a pre-competitive space and say look you all share the same landscape no, no i'm touching the table here <laughs> this is your field yeah. you all share it right yeah. it's not it's not your field for the year you take one crop off it and someone else's field for the year they take another crop off it it's the farmer's field mm. um and as such the farmer is the steward of that field and they can transform that land to be a regenerative landscape and they can do that with your support. But if if 
companies individually pile in with all of their own requirements, I think we start to get, we're seeing the early indications that that's creating friction. We're also seeing the early indications of companies really wanting to find those collective solutions. So this mm. is an area where probably much more, much more advanced than the policy environment, where very quickly companies have realized the companies we're talking to have realized, ah, we need to, we need to look at this differently. And we're working on a regenerative innovation portfolio, which it ad addresses this exactly, bringing together companies around landscapes of mutual interest so that they can truly find ways to work together so that mutually they support the farmers and the value chain in that landscape to transform rather than individually applying their requirements to farmers at, uh, and hoping that the landscape transformation happens as a result. I'm really sensing the the passion and conviction here, and I was listening to you on both those points. So you spoke about, you know, the fact that you know oil and gas industry is being heavily, heavily subsidised, but you know we're asking farmers to do you know more and more with less and less, uh, and then on the other side, you know, corporates, whilst wanting to do the right thing, are probably, by the sounds of it, overwhelming farmers in in terms of the requests. So it seems to me that at the centre of all of this because I was going to ask the question on where should we focus, it yeah. feels like what we're saying is farmers need more support from everybody across the food system. Is that is that what we're saying? Farmers need more support from everybody across the food system, and the food system needs some pretty radical innovation in this space yeah. to create an environment where that support can be given. So the concept today of, a, of the food value chain is still very, very linear. So a farmer has a maybe supplies through a co-op to off-takers and buyers that go into a secondary market out to a to a producer to a retailer etc it's a very linear process yeah. as it is in at the farm gate with their their inputs their fertilizers their pesticides their diesel etc what we are now investing in in innovation is how do you look at that whole system and say how can we share the risk across that whole system and make it a lot more circular mm -hmm. so it, this is what I'm really pushing for away from, you know, in the past, we might have done a project around looking at one element of that. How do you, how do you change the fertilizer mix in certain crops, for example, or how can you make digital information more available between an offtaker and a farmer with regard to the carbon footprint of their crops? And there's a lot of those individual technical solutions sprinkled throughout the value chain. But what we have to engineer is a fundamental rethink of how that value chain works. And if yeah. we stick with regenerative, right? You, what, any one farmer transforming their farm to regenerative, the change in their supply is not going to affect the market as a whole. So if, if they're a potato farmer and they're moving to regenerative production, their total yield of potatoes might drop by 20, 30%, but to compensate, they'll produce other other goods and services. So they might produce other crops, they might produce some ecosystem services, whether that's water management, flood risk prevention, possibly carbon, although we're really looking at, at the, the impact of carbon in soil. Any one farmer, that washes out in the value chain and mm -hmm. their buyers will find other potatoes to fill that gap. But when you look at a landscape as a whole, if all of the land in that landscape starts to transform, you've got a fundamental change in the supply demand dynamics. And so we need to start to connect those landscapes much more broadly. Um, and then you look at how do you risk share with those farmers? And today, if a farmer wants to transition their, their farming practice, they've got to buy the capital equipment themselves. They've got to take out all of the insurances against yield failure, et cetera. They, they really, 90% of the risk is pre-farm gate. And we're looking at deploying innovation to really address how can you change the food system post-farm gate so that it shares the risk from innovative financial innovation. So how can you dream up new financial products that sit outside the farm gate that will allow the farmer to deploy the change they need that might create leasing agreements for capital equipment or give them upfront payments against long-term supply contracts across multiple crops. Imagine a, an off-taker contract with multiple corporates together on the same contract combining crops and ecosystem services over a period of 10 years for farmers. Imagine what level of security that would give. Yeah. In order to affect that, we need real innovation in the in the market, in the modeling, in the offtake agreements, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why I feel it's it's absolutely the right space for us to be as a mm -hmm. food innovation agency. It's definitely not easy. I mean, some of these conversations are still very esoteric. I still get glazed looks from people when I talk to them about this. Um, could be me, but I think, <laughs> I think it's possibly because it's a complex topic. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's where that's really where I'd like us to take this. And 
yeah, going back to where I started from, there's, yes, this is challenging for the food sector, but there's so much potential for change mm. and you can affect real change really fast on the ground. Some of the things we're seeing that can be done in a field are truly transformative very, very quickly. And mm. we're doing some really, really exciting stuff with kind of very edge case innovation in farming practice, et cetera, that I think could be revolutionary in its ability to inspire people to change. And on that point, because I was going to ask you, you know, what we've kind of gone as often on the show, we go from mm. like the big challenges and then we start talking about the amazing things that you can do to solve those challenges through yeah. innovation. So what excites you about this area of innovation we're in now? You know, any any kind of real examples that you've seen, you're like, this could really affect massive change. Yeah, look, I'll share a couple of things. So at at uh, COP this year, we met um, an amazing guy, Vijay Kumar, who's created a system in India called natural farming. Right. And this is a radical transformation of the way smallholder farmers farm to reduce to zero their dependency on, on inputs um, and massively mitigates against the risk of crop failure through drought and flooding, etc. And right. without going into the full techniques, and it... it, it there's a huge amount of science behind it from Queensland University and others. Vijay's created this amazing network of well over a million farmers. It's created a real societal change there because they're, they're growing more a crops. A million farmers? Yeah, yeah. It's huge. Wow. But bear in mind that there are small-scale family farms. You know, the, the number of hands per sure. acre is significant. Yeah. Um, but it shows you can do something absolutely radically different that has zero downside i mean you see some of his pictures of plots of land where it's basically bare sand and then right next to it is this lush farmland and it, one is farmed traditionally one is farmed amazing in, it truly is inspiring and so for me whether that can translate into the european context we don't know but we're gonna we're gonna have a try mm. so we're gonna see what elements of that can be translated even if it is just the inspiration to try things differently there are hundreds of hurdles in bringing that to a highly mechanized, high scale, low manual input farming environment like Europe. But the benefits of at least taking a look at that, I think, could be huge. So right. I think there are systemic interventions like that, which I find really fascinating. Yeah. And we will engage in those areas specifically with a view to how can we translate that innovation at scale within the context of farming in, in Europe and hopefully then more broadly in the in the West. Um. So that's a, kind of the macro scale. Mm -hmm. Going to, a, to the other end of the scale, I mean, we've got some just incredible startups that do amazing things. And um, am I allowed to mention names? On the yeah, time? absolutely, okay. definitely. Yeah, so one of my, yeah, my favourites is Agrain. So I met them probably a year ago, at, first of all, at one of our events. And then I saw them do a demo for, for a large corporate that was looking for inspiration for changing its ingredients. Now, then, I need to say they're not unique in what they do. They're... they're using spent grain from brewing to produce a number of products yep. so they produce a flour they produce an ingredient that can be used as a substitute for dairy um, and i think a few other things as well but the fascinating part of the model is they take something which is effectively a waste product spent grain that the brewers either have to pay to have disposed of or mm. or they they get very very small amounts of money for it and agrain turn that into five times the value roughly of wow. of the original crop so the original, Five times the value of the original, original yeah. crop. So what wow. the farmer would have sold that crop for to the brewer and is then a spent crop, in inverted commas, they, they turn that into roughly five times the revenue through all of the products they make. God. So now this is so that inspiration number one is wow, you can really do stuff with with waste. And I think the food system is is so full of opportunities to mm. rethink what waste is in the food system. And we're seeing real innovation in many, many places. Coffee's got a lot of startups working on it. Yep. Um, We've got a few on the show, actually. Yeah. So coffee's very hot. I think, obviously, straws and other byproducts, is, is there's an awful lot going on there. Grains, spent grains, especially in brewing, there there is a lot going on there, all feeding into precision fermentation and technologies like that. But it also opens the door for fundamentally different business models. So now our grain aren't doing this, but imagine if as a farmer, you didn't sell your barley to a brewer, you rented it to the brewer. Right. So you rent, you do grain as a service. So you rent your barley. <laughs> grain well, as, as a, a service. service. Cheap gas. 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 Yeah, yeah. We need to work on the branding. <laughs> You're the branding pro. I'll just give you the idea. Um, gas. Right. <laughs> so 
but you could rent your grain to the brewer, back ship it, rent it to a flour mill so that they turn it into flour, back ship the residual, turn mm. that into uh, a another product, and finally you've got cattle feed or livestock feed that you can use back on your own farm. Mm. And you've turned something that initially was very linear, left the farm gate in a one-way transaction for X euros a tonne, and you've turned it into kind of a circular, circular product, well, kind of a spiral product that you're taking value out of it in multiple circles until mm. it finally comes back to you if you need it as a residual mm. um, that you actually put to good use on your farm. And so those that's where I find it really inspiring that it's not just the technical product. You've got real opportunity to completely rethink business models right. on uh, in the food system when you start to talk to amazing entrepreneurs and evangelists who've who've gone out on a limb bet their careers and their mortgages and their families on making a change in the world mm. those are the super super brave people that are, that are absolutely on the front line of what we're doing and and they open doors to so many possibilities yeah uh, th and thanks for that and uh, indeed you know we we have loads of those people in the community we've had lots of them on the show and it is you know truly truly inspiring um you know it's an amazing place to be Richard, so moving on to something else, I have it from very good authority yep. that uh, you're embarking at the moment on a 100 days uh, campaign, 100 days, 100 conversations. Yep. Really interested to know what is it exactly and why is this so important to you? Yes, so it is pretty much exactly that. <laughs> well, <laughs> over, there you go. Over, ne over the next 100 days, I'm really keen to talk to as many people as I can about how they see the food system that we work in, how they see us as EIT food, what they expect of us as a community, as what they expect of me as a leader, et cetera. Mm. So um, it's, this is a really interesting and complicated space. And I am really keen to make sure I, and actually the organization as a whole, go out there and listen at this mm. critical point in time. It's very, very easy to assume we know what we what we need to do. And I really don't want to fall into that trap. So this is very much about listening for a significant period of time, digesting that, bringing people together to talk to each other and understand how can we make the most of everything that we're going to be doing over the next, well, frankly, our next five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. So for me, if we get the foundations right now, now for me is a period of the next one or two years, we will be in the right place for the next five plus years and the only way we can really do that is through deep listening ar around our community starting very close to home starting with our team and making sure our, our deeply committed employees have got a chance to share their views share their fears ask their questions tell me what they're excited about mm. and then broaden that conversation into our community and our partners the startups the entrepreneurs the students etc who we've engaged with and then broader still in the companies that maybe we haven't engaged with, the, the NGOs and the philanthropies that we'd like to engage with, with the commission, et cetera. So 100 days, 100 conversations. Um, the first three weeks, first 15 days have been absolutely awesome and mm. really fantastic. I've spoken to some companies that are so committed to this agenda. It, it really inspires me to say, yeah, we're definitely on the right road with this. We've We've just got to keep pushing through the the resistance to change and the friction that comes sometimes in what we do. Um, companies, people, friends and family as well. It's really interesting to see actually how engaged people are in what we're trying to do, even if they're not in the sector mm. at all. So 100 days, 100 conversations, it's very much helping me and us as an organization and our community shape our thinking as we look ahead for the next five to 10 years. I love it. And um, you've mentioned listening a lot. So obviously, that's obviously something which is super important to you, I guess, without, um, you know, you don't have to mention any names or anything specific. But given who you have spoken to already, and I appreciate it's only been a very short period of time. Um, anything that you've learned, which has kind of surprised you or kind of uh, sort of Double, helped you double down on what you wanted to do already. Yeah, let's go with, go with a positive mm -hmm. um, and something that I, I'm i going to keep coming back to that's maybe less positive. Um, <laughs> on the positive side, a couple of the companies I've spoken to are are absolutely all in, to use a, a American vernacular. Right. They, they're, then this is not 
CSR and Greenwash, it's really, really inspiring when you look at the, the teams they've created, the people they've recruited, the commitments they've made, the budget they've put behind it. This is way beyond CSR reporting. Yeah. It's a deep, deep structural commitment to change in some of the companies that we're talking well, that's to. That's super positive. It really, really is. And um, I'm not going to do call outs here, um, but sure. I think the companies know who they are. And, and I am deeply grateful for the commitment that these companies have made and that I've had the privilege to talk to over the last few days and really understand what this means to them. And hopefully that will spread. And uh, again, having come from a big company background, it takes those kernels of of passion and resilience internally to keep banging that drum and pushing the agenda. But when when that takes hold, when that change takes hold, it's really revolutionary. And Hopefully, this is the start of the beginning of that wholesale transformation of many, many of the the larger companies in the sector. And that creates the pull through effect that encourages the smaller companies, the ones that find it harder to invest and harder to commit potentially to do so, knowing that their customers or their suppliers are with them on that journey. OK, so number one, all in commitment from yeah. from some. Yeah, great. You mentioned something maybe not quite as positive. Uh, yeah, I'm. I was at Davos this year, mm -hmm. and it's interesting. It's a it's a very very financial environment. My first time at Davos, yeah, and the the finance sector I think has got such a critical role to play here, and they're talking a very good game. Yet I I'm really struggling to pick up innovation in the finance sector the banks are still trying to be banks and the insurance companies are still trying to be insurance companies and yeah they'll tell you there is some innovation there but there's nothing really wow that blows me Game away changing. that's a totally different way of deploying funding mm -hmm. um, there is also a bit of a bit of someone else's problem field in terms of whose money needs to be deployed where you know the headliners will say we need to deploy trillions of dollars and yes ultimately the food systems transformation will be something which requires an awful lot of funding, but also generates an awful lot of value. And I think this idea that someone somewhere has to stump up trillions of dollars, what we actually need is banks and insurance companies and investors to be a little bit more comfortable on the risk horizon, just get in there with the various actors in the food system, whether that's supporting the organizations that are going to bring us really innovative biologicals and challenge the macro providers, whether it is with the big globals who are, who are also looking at those areas and you know, biologicals, different fertilizers, etc. Whether it's with farmers and farming cooperatives, or whether it's with retailers who are going to encourage consumers to make different choices through whatever mechanisms, labeling, front of pack, information, positioning. The the financial institutions need to really look at how can they stimulate that change um, much more innovatively. I would love them to do that, wouldn't I? Mm -hmm. the, and also recognise that it, this is about triggering a, a re-engineering of that finance system. The idea that it's going to cost trillions of dollars, ultimately maybe trillions of dollars will be spent in that transformation, but it's spent very productively. It comes back into GDP of every country. It's not, mon it's not a one-way money flow because as farmers get more productive, you see more food, um, more changes in the food system. You see higher value crops potentially coming into markets. You see brand new products coming onto market. You see retailers changing their business model and perhaps coming back on the high street maybe with mm. more local sourcing, et cetera, as farmers think more locally and reduce their overall um, sustainability footprint. There's so many ways this has a positive impact on the economy. And I just really like the, the to see how can we engage with the finance community in a much more productive conversation that says, get out of your traditional deployment of balance sheet and get into the food systems transformation more effectively. Okay, because I was going to ask you, you know, yeah, as part of this campaign, who who do you hope to talk to? So are you hoping to talking to the finance companies, the banks, the investors to try and unpick why it is that they're not you know, maybe investing as they should do and you know, hopefully we can convince them? Are, are you looking yeah, to talk to them? Absolutely. I'd love to talk to them. I'd yeah. love to understand where where are they thinking their model could be redeployed? So yeah. if you're thinking about the food system as a whole today, a lot of the thinking is maybe on returns from carbon credits or loans to farmers and interest based on on farmer payments and carbon credits. Yeah. It's, it's a bit kind of route one. Um, and I really want to talk to them and say, look, in the behind the scenes, 
what are you kicking around? You know, what's the internal innovation? Can we create an open innovation community around you that might stimulate much more creative thinking or support you to have the confidence that very different mechanisms can be achieved here? Yeah. So I'd love to to hear from that community about what would make the difference to them to really invest in a different way or deploy capital in a different way. Um, and that might be working with them just to understand what might the food system look like in 20, 30 years if we do get the fundamental transformation that we need in order for that system to be sustainable and resilient. So you heard it here, folks. So banks, financial institutions, come talk to Richard because he wants to listen to what you have to say as part of these hundred, this 100 days, uh, 100 conversations campaign. So there's the ask. Um, Richard, we're we're sort of getting to the the, you know, the the end of the show. We always try to do something a little bit a little right. bit lighter, All right, a little right. bit lighter. Um, and actually, I was saying to you at the start of the show, this is something I've I wanted to try on on previous guests. I'm so. your performing circus animal, am I? Yeah. <laughs> you are the guinea pig. But you know, it's because we we talk about very very important, but sometimes quite you know heavy heavy topics, and mm. it's nice to finish on something a little bit lighter. Plus, it's also quite nice for people to get to know you a little bit better mm. as a as a as a CEO. <laughs> Um, and as a person. All right. Um, so I, I was thinking of doing something. We're going to call it the quick fire round. Okay. All right. So because you've t- said to me that you like you like uh, thinking on your feet. Mm-hmm. So I'll ask you a question and you can just give me some short, snappy answers. Yeah. Uh, up for that? All right. Go All right. for it. Okay. So we'll start with easy. Okay. Very easy. Tea or coffee? Tea in the morning, coffee at two. Oh, okay. Tea yeah. and coffee. All yeah. right. Got it. City or countryside? Countryside, yeah, definitely. Yeah, right with you. Mm-hmm. Okay, favourite book and or podcast? Oh, well, I, I have to give a plug for a podcast called The Bugle since it's my brother's <laughs> and The Illusionist, <laughs> which is my sister's. Um, favourite book? I'm going to um, give a fairly boring one, uh, but Black Box Thinking. Um, if you haven't read Black Box Thinking, it's a real brain changer as is everybody lies which i would strongly recommend okay. so those are the those are the kind of serious books um there's a book by tom robbins called still life with woodpeckers which i with, with woodpecker which i really love and okay. it come back to time and again it's a bit absurdist it's a bit ridiculous but i really enjoy it all right love it thank you and yes i've forgotten that your uh, your family is podcast royalty so yeah. big big shout out there there you go andy helen you've had your plug that's it. <laughs> Job done. <laughs> Tick. Um, your one tip for improving food waste. Whoa, okay. Um, I did say this is going to rove around. Yeah, one tip for improving food waste. Gosh, I, I think it would be better engagement between the farmers and the retailers and probably society to accept that food doesn't look like an Instagram model. Mm. Um, food, is, food is wonky. Food is is natural it's a natural product and that pressure to produce something instagrammable that is a raw you know a a carrot or an apple or a potato or a steak that looks perfect that clearly creates a lot of pressure on farmers um i would love to see more of a view of of food as a as an ingredient rather than food as a instagram product yeah Um, that i think would make a massive difference perfectionism in food eh? yeah yeah okay um Jumping around again. So what does success mean for you? Um, it means enjoying what I do with people that I enjoy working with and looking looking ahead at something that's really interesting and challenging and saying we can we can do this and ultimately looking back and saying I enjoyed I enjoyed having a shot at that. Nice. Uh, the technology that most excites you right now, oh. and that doesn't have to be in the food industry. That can be broader. Any, you know, I know you like your gadgets and your things at <laughs> home. So anything, anything which uh, excites you at the moment. Yeah, wow, um, that is a big one. I think, uh, I do think in the food system, robotics is is mm-hmm. interesting. I know it's probably not going to be. Um, as quick as people want it to be, but I do think that has got such huge implications for supporting farmers in particular to do things that they they just couldn't have done, like precision farming. That element of what's going on in the field is is for me really fascinating. On a, on a more personal basis, I'm not actually that techie at home. Oh, I thought you were. No, not really, yeah. because um, I get a bit frustrated when stuff goes wrong. Right. Um, I'm trying to think what technology 
would I... Because you're the person who in- introduced me to the AeroPress coffee. Oh, OK. So AeroPress, yeah, that is a brilliant piece of technology. I would say the air fryer is my next my uh, next journey. Yeah, OK. Um, I could not live in it. Uh, it's the one kitchen gadget. I don't count the AeroPress as a gadget. I count that as a coffee maker. OK, all right. Air fryer. I stand corrected. It, <laughs> But it's bloody good, isn't it? It's Come on. Good. It's very Come good. Come on. Instant coffee, no mess. Yeah. Um, that bit will probably get cut. The... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Um, air fryer for kitchen. Now, again, back to food. I cook a lot. I'm, mm. I'm, I really enjoy cooking. And it's not often you get something that goes, ah, there's a whole different way of cooking here. And it, it's more energy efficient. It genuinely is. It's quicker. You can turn food around for the family quicker. It does some stuff really really nicely i know jay rayner doesn't agree but jay you're wrong when it comes to the family dinner it's, oh, it's so easy <laughs> roasted carrots in the air fryer yum 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 <laughs> little pomonti potatoes absolutely delicious uh, i can't believe we've just dissed jay rayner on the show i okay. love i love his column yeah he's so. just wrong about air fryers okay all right uh, got that Ad- admittedly haven't tried air fryers yet i'm i've been skeptical but uh, people mm. keep telling me that uh, it's a game changer so it is absolutely okay thank you um can anyone be an entrepreneur? That is a big question. Of course they can be an entrepreneur, but some people are never really given the chance to think about it properly. And I think this is it's kind of a big question. Mm. Um, when, when we look at the different paths that people have from a young age in life, there are some some people who really just never get the, the support then that they need from an educational perspective, from from the, from the environment they have to really think about what's it going to take for me to set up on my own. Um, and I would love that environment to be available to many, many more people, especially yep. in the food sector. Truly, I mean, I doubt, I doubt you're going to meet anybody who's never had a bright idea for something that they think this could make a difference in the world. Yep. Um, and when I speak to people about food, it's again it's it's a universal topic every single human on the planet eats hopefully once a day at the very minimum hopefully. so everyone's got ideas about food about how they might like to see things different so i do think it the food system is a has huge potential for entrepreneurs to come through anyone can be an entrepreneur but it's really bloody hard and i have such enormous respect for the people that that we talk to every day here at EIT food who've made that jump and have committed themselves to creating something amazing out of nothing yeah. in the food system. So I would love more people to feel that that is something they can do without the, the the huge risk that it often carries and without the stigma of failure. I think the we often talk about the US entrepreneur culture and you'll meet people over there who've done multiple businesses and failed hmm. and they're still going and they've had peaks and troughs of success and failure and that's fantastic and they're proud of that and the community that they work in is proud of that that's not societally so much the case here it's mm. improving it's becoming much more of an option straight out of out of school or straight out of university to go and start something i think again if we can do one thing just individually is champion that as a great option and and treat people with pride and respect you've gone out on a limb and done it and and really give them all the support we can definitely yeah i think courage is a big thing there and actually and for anyone who's listening who wants to be an entrepreneur in the food system then of course you know eit food is also here to help you on that journey so please do get in get in touch check out our courses online exactly yeah. um, over two hundred thousand people now in our courses um you mentioned changing the world for the better. What's the one thing, if that's even possible, you would recommend to every person trying to change the food system? Think about what you're eating. Mm-hmm. And I've been doing this for a little while since, well, very much since joining EIT Food. Yeah. And you realise your choices can make a real difference. And I also realised that I am very, very privileged to be able to make choices about what I eat. Yeah. So I think the one thing, if you're listening to this podcast, hopefully you're in a position to think about your food. You're here listening because you care about your food and just think about the choices you make. And a, and a real eye-opener for me was a conversation I had with my sister who lives in Canada now. And she has gone uh, mostly plant plant-based i think she's she's uh entirely vegetarian and i think mostly plant-based right um 
And we were talking about the impact that would have versus a meat-based diet and, uh, sorry, of that and flying to the UK versus a meat-based diet. Yeah. And I realized, I mean, I don't, I, it doesn't matter what I do or don't eat really, but I, I don't eat red meat mainly for personal preference. And I thought, well, oh, hang on, what is the real, surely that can't, it can't be comparable. And I went and did a little bit of research about red meat. And truly, if you eat a, an average amount of red meat for a, for a European consumer, um, then you, on an annual basis, you you are basically eating a flight's worth over the Atlantic, pretty much, in wow. terms of carbon footprint. And I was truly blown away, both the, by the fact that, A, I didn't know this already. Mm. Um, as somebody who's been in the field, those numbers are so difficult to get an assured number. And it took me a good few hours of reading to get myself to the point where I thought, okay, there's this yeah. is a credible number. Um, and then actually, you know, you can make real choices. Now, eat red meat or fly. I prefer, you know, I'd much prefer don't eat red meat and don't fly. Mm. Um, but really thinking about what you're eating, both from an environmental and sustainability perspective, from a health perspective, um, can make such a huge difference. I mean, if so many people that we, we talk to are at work, people get very stressed. Right now, people are working super hard in, in our field, in many fields, the start of the year, there's work pressure on every, everybody. Thinking about what you eat to make you feel good is, again, really important to give mm. you the true nourishment you need, not just the calories. So very, very long answer to a quick fire question, but if you could do one thing, just stop and give yourself time to think about what you eat. Wise words. Thank you, Richard. I love this section. I'm going to have to start doing this more on the podcast, I think. Um, Richard, thank you. This has been you know, an amazing conversation. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, I've also really appreciated the candor and the honesty. It's not, not always something you get with CEOs. So I really appreciate that. And I guess because of that, I'd kind of like to give you the floor to finish. Um, so what last piece of advice or wisdom would you like to leave us all with? Yeah, I'm not sure I'm ready for advice and wisdom yet. Uh, but what I would like to just say is we've got an amazingly engaged group of listeners who are, who are downloading this podcast and they're they're on their way to work or they're in the park walking the dog and they're, they're listening and engaged in this episode, many others before and many others after. And I just really say to the to the people who are listening to this, this is you as well. When we talk about food systems transformation, it's something that happens at a personal, at a human, individual and collective level. It is not a it's not a corporate machine endeavor. It's a human endeavor when we want to change the food system. And so please share your views back with us, share your thoughts and ideas, because we are a channel for those ideas and that inspiration back into our innovation community. And we really want to hear from you what you think is going to make make a difference to this. So, um, yeah, it's it's your collective wisdom and your collective ideas that can help us shape where we take our work, our community, our partners and startups and, and education, et cetera, we, we can use that voice and shape what we do. So please, um, yeah, that's all I would ask is share your thoughts. Don't just listen to us, but engage with us. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. Share your thoughts, everyone. Please get in touch. I mean, so Richard, first of all, what should I say at the end, congrats again Thank on, you. The, on the new role. But you mentioned people getting in, getting in touch. If people do want to reach out to you or to us, where would you recommend they kind of look you up? Oh, wow, okay. Um, on our website, I would hope, Matt, would be a good place to start. <laughs> well, they can uh, certainly find you, but in terms of your website. own channel, for My example. own channel, I guess most of... I'm not I'm not a very good social. I'm, I'm the wrong generation for, for Insta, etc. Oh, that will change. Um, that will change, will it? Okay, good. I uh, look forward to that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be doing my own silly cat impressions on Instagram That's Reels, right. will I? Okay, good. Uh uh, LinkedIn is good. Yep. I like I like the kind of the, the conversation and the engagement on LinkedIn. Um, we do have a great community on Food Hive, so if you're a member of Food Hive, please do engage there. Come and talk to us. Um, if you if you're not already there, and I'm sure you've got channels for the Food Fight podcast um, and our so newsletter you, as well. The yep. feed, everyone, please check that out as well. Yeah. So yeah, just it, just come and talk to us. Share your ideas. Ask questions. Again, we don't uh, often the questions that I get asked are. Um, from the bravest of the brave in the audience and really keen to hear a broader spectrum of questions. Mm -hmm. What's on your mind is probably on somebody else's mind or many other people's minds. So please do, don't be shy to ask your questions. And, and again, we will, I'm sure, Matt, find ways to address those questions as we go along through the year. Definitely. 
great stuff. Thank you again, Richard. It's been a joy. Thank you for having me, Matt. 